Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Leading Great Teams, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Lieutenant General George S. Patton Jr. spent the morning of April 3, 1943, touring the Tunisian front lines of the 1st and 9th Divisions and the command post of Colonel Clarence Benson. Grief-stricken by the loss of Captain Dick Jensen, his aide and a close family friend, Patton had taken his frustration out on British leaders. By his estimation, rather than patrolling the skies over his battlefield, Allied airmen had employed at least a thousand planes to strike the German Air Force elsewhere. His April 1st situation report criticized the British by stating, Total lack of air cover for our units has allowed German Air Forces to operate almost at will. Patton returned to his Gafsa headquarters to find a telegram from Air Vice Marshal Arthur Coningham, the New Zealander who commanded the Allied Tactical Air Forces. It was a scathing reply to Patton's protests. Coningham claimed that Patton's soldiers must not be battle-worthy in terms of present operations. The touchy affair with Air Command became even more volatile at noon when a group of Allied air chiefs arrived at Patton's headquarters in hopes of soothing the tensions. Patton found the air commanders to be clearly uncomfortable as they discussed the situation. In the midst of his heated exchange with them, Patton was interrupted by the whine of four German Focke-Wulf fighters roaring in at low altitude. The officers quickly took cover on the floor. The fighter's final run resulted in a chunk of shrapnel ripping a hole through the wall of the conference room. Patton charged from the room to the wall. Patton fired his trusted Colt at the departing planes, his blood boiling. Fortunately, no one was injured. One of the officers turned to Patton and casually inquired how the American commander had arranged such a perfect demonstration of the lack of aerial protection. I'll be if I know, but if I could find the sons of who flew those planes, I'd mail each one of them a medal. Hello, everyone. I'm Joe Craig, and welcome to this episode of Army Matters. The clip you just heard is a reenactment of a famous World War II moment taken from the new book Patton's Payback, The Battle of El Guitar and General Patton's Rise to Glory by Stephen L. Moore. There have been countless books, documentaries, and films about Patton, but this new book dives into how his experiences in North Africa in 1943 defined his approach and spurred the Army to success in the Second World War. It's a riveting book, and I'm honored to have Steve author of over 20 books on World War II and Texas history, here on the show today to discuss the news story further. Steve, welcome to Army Matters. Hey, Joe. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Why do you think uh, General George S. Patton is such a popular figure from World War II? And what made you decide to focus on him for your new book? Well, some of us may remember the uh, 1970 movie with uh, George C. Scott playing Patton and have memories of him from that way. But he's just a kind of a flamboyant and irreverent and just a fiery leader. And actually, the idea for this particular book uh, came about from Brent Howard, my editor at uh, Dutton in New York. I've done a number of uh, World War II Pacific War type titles, and he thought it was just overdue to have a fresh look at how Patton came to rise to power in his first big command campaign. And frankly, for me, it was a big learning experience to dive in and, and just absorb everything I could about the man and the men who served under him. Right. Well, as you turned your attention uh, away from the Pacific, uh, 
going towards the U.S. Army's first combat operations in World War II. You know, obviously, it's taking place uh, following the landings in North Africa in November 1942. So maybe you could just uh, set the stage for our listeners and give us a brief overview of the situation as the story begins. Sure. You know, Patton was actually in charge of one of the landing divisions that came ashore, as you mentioned, uh, in November of 42. But he does not really come into the picture in, in a command status until March of 43. So by that time, the Allies are pushing into Tunisia against the Germans and the Italians. And things have not gone so well in February. We've had a couple of big major battles there, including Kasserine Pass, where some may technically say the Americans won because we had the Germans fall back after the battle. But we suffered greatly in terms of equipment lost, personnel lost. And the commanding general, Lloyd Friedendahl, was kind of shown for what he was. He was not a capable commander. So that kind of sets the stage for Patton to come in shortly thereafter. And how would you compare Patton to Friedendahl? Friedendahl had a place you know, some called Lloyd's Last Resort his command post being almost 100 miles from the front line actions. He's dug in a, a bomb-proof bunker, and he issues commands that to some are confusing, that you know, they don't know what exactly he's asking them to do. Uh, he's got the 1st Armored, for example, splintered into three different factions. So we're not a cohesive unit. When Patton comes into play, he is an in-your-face command kind of guy up front, he wants to see what's going on and be seen by the troops. The complete opposite of Fredendahl and, and what he had done with the men. When Patton took over, what sorts of changes did he implement? Did the troops buy into his style right away? Yes, yeah, he rolls into two corps on uh, March 6, 1943. He comes in with sirens wailing with his command patrol and immediately sets the stage that this is a different guy in place. The following morning, he's taking his breakfast at 0700. And he notices all the staffers casually rolling in about 9 o'clock, 9.30 to have their breakfast. And he ordered that day forward, shut down the mess hall at 7.30. And he said, from this day forward, by God, they're going to be on time. So he started with the top leaders and worked his way down the ranks. And a lot of folks have read some of the famous stories about officers having to wear neckties in the desert and enlisted men having to wear the leggings and wear the steel battle helmets on their head instead of the soft skull caps. They learned quickly it was a must under Patton because he would throw you in the brig or fine you $25. And in the case of a private first class, that's probably about a month's pay back in those days. Right. So he quickly got their attention. One of the units that uh, kind of ran foul of those rules uh, on a regular basis were the guys from the 1st Ranger Battalion, you know, famous uh, Darby's Rangers. Can you tell us about the Rangers and, and their role in the story? Yeah, as we look at modern special forces, this is one of the, the first elite groups put together. You know, the first Ranger Battalion rosters pulled together in June of 42. And a couple of men I follow, Lieutenant Les Ness and Les Cook, both from Iowa. Mr. Cook was the last living original Darby's Ranger from the June 42 muster roll. He's passed away since then, but I had the pleasure and the honor of speaking with him and learning about how this elite 500 group of men trained and learned amphibious assaults and stealth operations in the desert. And Patton would put them to good use during the North Africa campaign. Well, you know, they play a part in what's the centerpiece battle of, of the book, uh, the Battle of El Qatar. Can you give our listeners uh, an overview of what's happening in El Qatar, both tactically and strategically? Yeah, they are called upon to take the town of El Qatar to attack uh, an Italian outpost up in the mountains, up in the hills. And so you've got just these hundreds of men going against the enemy, their faces blackened, all their dog tags taped, slipping through the night, crawling over boulders, down ravines to slip up on the enemy outpost before dawn and make a surprise raid, which they did. And they took the enemy badly by surprise, capturing hundreds of Italian prisoners and securing key ground that's going to be a, a key point for the battle that's coming up just a few days later. Les Ness, one of the guys I covered, had his own little uh, run-in with Patton for being out of uniform and being disrespectful. So he didn't have a great love for the man, but Patton soon came to respect the Rangers for what they were able to accomplish. Well, you know, thanks to the uh, combined efforts uh, of U.S. forces, they were able to be successful at El Qatar. 
you compared uh, you know, Patton versus Frendall. I'm wondering how Patton got along with other uh, commanders that were under him, guys like Terry Allen or Lucian Truscott. You know, he went out of his way to make sure they understood who was in charge. Uh, Pinky Ward, Orlando Ward, was one of his uh, subordinate generals, and he was called out by Patton for not being aggressive enough and actually told to get to the front lines and take this particular hill. You know, even if it caused you to have some officers killed, get those officers out in the front. So Ward probably didn't think too highly of Patton, but uh, Ward and his men were able to take that hill briefly. Uh, Ward was wounded. Patton had to give him a medal later for his valor. But ironically, weeks later, he would dismiss Ward from command. Roosevelt and Allen, of course, being in charge of the Big Red One, they were you know, superior leaders, although Patton, again, called out Allen when he first met up with him inspecting his troops. They had too many slit trenches dug, and Patton wasn't in favor of all these guys taking cover during the German bombing raids. So he asked Terry, which one is your trench? And Allen, of course, points it out. Patton proceeds to walk over and urinate right there in the trench and say, now jump in there and use that. So kind of humiliating to the man's troops underneath him, but he was making his presence felt, and he, he wanted them to know you're going to be out front. You're going to lead. And if you get killed in the process of it, so be it. But get out of those trenches. <laughs> well, that's certainly an interesting approach to leadership. We're going to take a quick break now. But when we return, we'll find out more about the meaning of the title of the new book, Patents Payback. Did you know, as a member of AUSA, you have access to many benefits? From car rental to entertainment discounts, the opportunities are ample. Visit AUSA.org benefits to learn more. We're back with Stephen L. Moore, author of the new book, Patton's Payback, The Battle of El Guitar and General Patton's Rise to Glory. Just before the break, you were talking about Patton and how he dealt with some of the commanders that reported to him. Now, I know he also had contentious relationships with the British allies. How much did he fight with them along the way? Uh, he was not really in favor of being you know, told what to do and how to do it. He stepped out of line a couple of times. Probably one of the more famous exchanges uh, came a little bit later after the main battle of El Guitar while he's still in command, uh, April Fool's Day, April 1st, one of his trusted friends and aides on his command staff, a uh, guy by the name of Dick Jensen, is sent forward to the front lines. The Germans come in with a, an attack and Jensen is killed. So Patton kind of goes on one of his tirades against the British Air Command saying you're not giving two corps sufficient cover. Our men are exposed. We're getting killed needlessly. The British fire back with their own pretty fiery response that makes it all the way up to the Pentagon. And they kind of call Patton maybe calling out Wolf, crying Wolf on April Fool's Day. And maybe his men aren't disciplined enough to handle it. Goes back and forth and gets pretty heated to where a day later, the British Air Command comes down to Patton's headquarters to try to soothe the tensions. And in the midst of their conversation, while they're having this heated exchange, four German fighters come flying in, dropping bombs and strafing Patton's headquarters, blasts a hole right through their conference room with shrapnel. Patton races out in the street with his Colt revolvers firing at the planes and comes back in. And one of the British air commanders says, that's pretty impressive, George. How, how did you manage to coerce the enemy into putting on that effective demonstration while we're here? And his answer is basically... I'll be damned if I know, but if I could find those SOBs, I would mail each one of them a medal. <laughs> That's a great story. The death of his friend Dick Jensen really affected Patton, right? Was it the only personal loss that he experienced while in North Africa? And how did that experience push him to success in the battlefield? Yeah, the Patton's payback uh, title is you know not only the losses we'd kind of suffer there in February, but amongst those losses uh, around Valentine's Day was... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Waters, who was a second in command of the 1st Armored, Patton's own son-in-law. Waters and another group of men are holding a key high ground position, and it's pretty quickly determined that the Germans are going to overrun it. But Fredendahl at the time keeps them in position until it's far too late for them to pull out. And so Patton's son-in-law, Waters, is captured by the Germans, taken prisoner of war, Patton doesn't know it for a week or two, but he eventually finds out that his son-in-law is alive. But uh, he basically tells his diary, I'm going to go in there and kick these guys around and see if I can find out what's going on. So he, he certainly has several different angles for vengeance that he wants, uh, particularly 
his own family's loss in, in form of a capture there. Whether it's you know, for personal reasons or just you know doing his job, Patton certainly goes on to success uh, in, in El Guitar. Can you talk about the significance of that victory and uh, what happened after that? Yeah, the, the North Africa campaign in general was, you know, a learning ground for the American troops. You know, we've, we've done some island raids such as Guadalcanal and different places, but putting ashore infantry, artillery, armored special forces, and finally getting them by March and April of 43 to operate in a cohesive fashion, that was one of the significant points of Patton to bring these kind of ill-prepared men and whip them into shape to operate in an effective manner, taking hilltop after hilltop, valley after valley. What we learn there is going to set the stage for future operations. Patton is called out of the command campaign toward the very end uh, so that he can prepare for Operation Husky, the invasion of Sicily. But I think a lot of, of what we accomplished driving the Germans to the far coast of Tunisia and ultimately capturing them by the hundreds of thousands better prepared us for things like Normandy and, and our other European invasions to come. And in addition to preparing uh, future battles in World War II, you know, what lessons can today's army leaders take from Patton's command style? Yeah, a lot of people can uh, criticize the man for being pretty profane and abusive even at times, but he had some traits or qualities about him that leaders could follow today, even uh, Zelensky over in the Ukraine. One is being an effective communicator, people understanding your message, having the ability to motivate people. In a lot of cases with Zelensky and with Patton, that is done in the form of leading from the front. Patton would go to the extreme of almost reckless disregard for his own life. He's got his Colt revolvers on his hips in kind of cowboy fashion, but he's wearing his stars on his helmet, on his jacket, on his command vehicles even having his drivers go through minefields where others are scared to advance and driving directly to the front lines under enemy fire pretty much has no fear to the point of being stupid, according to some, but he made his point. He wasn't a, a background general like his predecessor. He was at the front and if it wasn't going well, he let you know it wasn't going well. It's an amazing story and uh, thank you for sharing that with our listeners. So Steve, thanks so much for being our guest today on Army Matters. Joe, so great to be here. Thank you. Stephen Moore's new book is Patton's Payback, The Battle of El Guitar and General Patton's Rise to Glory, available at bookstores and online right now. I'm Joe Craig from AUSA's book program. Thanks for listening. Have a great Army Day. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Hua.